If I told you that one of these was a booba and one of these was a kiki, how many of you would say that this one's the booba and this one's the kiki by a show of hands? Now that's what's known as the booba kiki effect. And those first demonstrated almost 100 years ago, the reason behind it is still something of a mystery. Now the fact that these meaningless words, booba and kiki, can seem to go along with a certain shape better than another demonstrates that the phonemes they contain, and by extension the phonemes we use for our words in general, can be inherently meaningful with some features that make them a better match for some kinds of things than others. On a larger scale, what this suggests is the way that we pair words and meaning in language may not be entirely arbitrary. But what's driving this? What makes the phonemes in booba seem like a perfect match for that shape? A lot of you will quickly say that it's the shape of the letters. Booba has round letters, Kiki has jagged letters, case closed. And while that's part of the story, that isn't the whole story, because this association exists even in cultures with wildly different writing systems. So if it isn't the shape of the letters, what I propose to you is that it's the way letters feel as you say them. Booba feels kind of round and soft, whereas Kiki feels kind of sharp and jagged. Now a nice way to test this would be to somehow prevent people from feeling these non-words as they said them, and then to see if the effect went away. Of course, that's kind of a hard thing to do. And even if we got people to just read these non-words silently, Studies have shown that they'd still be simulating, sort of imagining pronouncing them out loud, so they'd still get a sense of what they felt like. But now what if we could interfere with that simulation? And because Booba and Kiki depend on such different kinds of articulation, what if we could selectively interfere with the simulation of only sharp articulations in non-words like Kiki, and then see if the effect went away just for those? So that's what we set out to do. We brought participants into the lab and showed them non-words one at a time, just said, read these silently to yourselves. Then we gave them a choice between two shapes like this, and said, choose a shape that you think is the best match for the non-word that you just read. But while they were doing this, they were clicking. They were going <coughs> Now what that should do is occupy the part of the brain responsible for simulating sharp articulations in non-words like kiki, but do nothing for the round ones. And when we did this, we saw a drastic decrease in the association between sharp non-words and shapes, but no change for the round ones, suggesting that this booba kiki effect at least in part depends on experiencing these non-words articulations. And we also found something that was maybe even cooler. We had a set of neutral non-words that weren't strongly associated with either kind of shape. When we had participants click, suddenly they became strongly associated with the round shapes. So it's almost as though by interfering with the simulation of the sharp articulations, we highlighted whatever round features were present in the neutral non-words articulations. So we feel like we've taken a step forward in solving this almost 100-year-old mystery, and in the process found evidence that the way words feel as you say them can contribute to their meaning. And by changing the way, the word, the way that words feel, we can almost change what they seem to mean. And this might be one mechanism by which individual phonemes can seem to go along with some things better than others based on the way they feel. And this way of looking at language as something tangible, something that we almost experience physically as we use it, is something that I find fascinating and I'm really looking forward to studying over the next few years. Thanks.